Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's Economy in Plain English with Professor Diane Coyle. We are live on LinkedIn, X, and YouTube. Economy in Plain English is brought to you by the David Hume Institute and journalist Claire English. We are on a mission to increase understanding of the economy, what it is and how it works, and all in plain English. If you have any questions as we go, please ask away and we'll try to incorporate them. We only have 30 minutes, so if there's something you want to ask Diane, please do get in quick. Now, I'm not going to uh, talk any longer. I'm just going to hand over to Claire to get us started. Hello, it's lovely to be back and it's wonderful to have you with us, Diane. Very good indeed. I have your book sitting here. We will talk a little bit about that, obviously, as we go along. There you go, everyone. Here comes the punt, Cogs and Monsters. We'll stick it up there. I'm enjoying it. I'm making my way through it. I cannot pretend that I know everything in that or understand everything in that, but that is the point of uh, the economy in plain English. And I hope you will enjoy this conversation with Diane. So maybe we start off with the bleeding obvious here and I get you to give us a little bit about your, your background, who you are, where you came from, and maybe even how you label yourself or identify uh, as an economist, what sort of economist, Diane? Oh gosh, well, I've done um, all kinds of jobs as an economist. Um, so when if, if somebody asks, I say, I just say, I'm an economist. Um, the downside of that is that often they want to ask you about mortgage rates or what's going to happen to their investments. And that's the kind of economics I absolutely don't do. So I'm not a macroeconomist, I'm a microeconomist, which means thinking about what do firms do, what do households do, what do, how do markets work. So it's a sort of smaller scale. Um, I suppose I think I do applied work. So looking at data, trying to understand the world through looking at data. Um, but I've done lots of different jobs with that hat. So I started out in the Treasury, UK Treasury in London. Um, I worked for a private company called DRI doing economic forecasting. I was a journalist myself for many years, writing about economics, hopefully in ways that people could understand. Then I set up a consultancy, did consulting, mainly around technology markets. And most recently, I've been a, um, uh, an academic. So I'm at the University of Cambridge, professing. Professing, indeed. But you know, you're a rare beast because most economists don't have that kind of breadth of experience, do they? I suppose it's quite a rare combination. So um, certainly the, the communication skill that you learn from journalism, the um, insights into business that you get from consulting or working in the private sector, plus the academic, that is quite, quite an unusual mix. And um, I'm really pleased. It's been endlessly fascinating. And I feel I just learn, have learned much more through having those different perspectives. I love that you say it's endlessly fascinating and I'm beginning to find it fascinating because for many years I'd have run the other way if somebody <laughs> said something about the economy. How, well, I guess maybe the big part of your mission is to spread the word and say this is relevant to everyone. So I'm just wondering if you would say what is the job of an economist? Oh, Claire, it's the most interesting thing there is because you're asking really important questions. What makes people better off or not? What does it mean to say our society is making progress? Um, how, how can we arrange things so that uh, people have enough to live on, that it's shared fairly? Uh, what are we going to do about climate change? How should the education system be run in ways that recognise that people behave like humans and are going to behave in certain ways? So all of these, the, the economic lens on all of these important social questions brings a lot of insights. Now, many economists think it's the only lens you should bring to bear, and that's a mistake, but it's an incredibly powerful way to address the big questions in our society. And is it an art or a science? Because I'm guessing value judgments come in, all sorts of things leak in because you're asking people to make a call on something or analyze something. They're going to come at it from their own perspective, aren't they? Well, many economists would say it's a science and certainly it has some of those features. Would you? So, um, I think it's both. Um, so things like that are scientific, like being really clear about the logic that you're thinking through, um, understanding data that's relevant to addressing the question, trying to be as objective as possible in the analysis that you do. That I think is scientific method that other scientists do. But one of the critiques in the book that you kindly held up to show to people earlier is that a lot of economists insist that they only do the science and they forget that they're making value judgments. And so we've got this word efficiency, which sounds like you're an engineer. And so the comparison is often made. Economists are like dentists, they can fix the hole in your tooth. They're like plumbers, they can mend your leaking tap. 
Um, but actually, we don't mean efficiency in that sense. We mean efficiency in a very specific sense about how well are people's preferences being satisfied. And as soon as you start talking about that, you're in the realm of value judgments. So I think we should be much more open and honest, including with ourselves, about where the value judgments come in. And you can still be impartial about it. You can still say, well, this is my value and this is what I think. Um, but here, by the way, is the analysis that I can show you that explains why I think that. And it is all in the book, and I'm going to do it again, but it's you basically got on to hear what the economy is and what it should be. So obviously you think it should be something else, something maybe more than it's doing at the moment, but we'll get on to that because the title is intriguing enough in your book, Cogs and Monsters. Can you explain where that came from? Well, the cogs are the way that the classic economic models think about us as individuals. We are you know, cogs in this big social machine and we're making our own decisions. And of course, there are interactions, but we each think about what is what you know, what is in it for me? We're making our own choices, given that context. Um, the monsters are the way the economy is behaving with all of the new technologies and new kinds of problems that we face. And we don't really know where we're going or how to tackle the problems. And whether that's the tipping points that come with climate change, and are we changing fundamental weather patterns, or whether it's um, the way that big di that digital markets end up with big companies dominating them. Um, the economic analysis isn't kind of part of the everyday toolkit, and there are some questions that we haven't really answered. You know, when 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 are we going to get when are we going to go too far in terms of warming? The number actually matters, and although there are lots of economists now starting to think about the problem, we need to be able to tell the government. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but now is the moment at which you've got to introduce the carbon border tax or whatever it might be. So that, that, turning that into the everyday toolkit of economists is what the monsters part is about. It sounds absolutely essential. When you say it like that, you think, well, why haven't we done this earlier? Why indeed? Why haven't economists been looking at all this stuff? It seems incredible. I mean, we're in the 21st century now, but we've been used to having a digital world around us for quite a long time now. It's a bit slow and there are lots of people doing this kind of work, so I don't want to diss the profession in that sense. But if you remember those um, seaside arcade games, the Penny Falls, where you got to roll pennies down the chute and at some point 150 pennies will fall out and you won. Um, but it's really hard to predict that exact point, except we need to know. And those are the kinds of questions. So it is inherently very hard and people, really clever people are working on what are the right kinds of tools to think about those challenges. Um, and we're just not quite there yet. And it's certainly not the way we're teaching economics to first year students or sixth forms. Yeah, I do want to talk to you about that uh, a little bit later, but you know, it, it does seem there's so much when we talk about um, digital, we're talking about tech, big data, social media, internet, uh, there are many opportunities as well as, as problems there. So where are the opportunities that we're not milking yet? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of the innovations in tech have come out of Silicon Valley um, or the US generally, and they reflect the people who are doing the innovating, which is a, like economics, actually very male, um, quite homogeneous group who think about problems like how can I get my pizza delivered quickly? Um, so the opportunities are thinking about what are all the use cases, as the business term would have it, for this tech that haven't been spotted because those kinds of people haven't been raising the questions. So the, the, you know, what's the direction of the innovation? What amazing new things could we do with this technology? And how are we going to make it affordable? Who's going to pay for it? How do we spread it as quickly as possible? So all of those are real opportunities. I want to talk about adver uh, diversity, uh, adversity, diversity and education in a minute. But Susan, I want you to jump in with your thoughts. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I was just uh, just double checking that we're all on different channels. If you saw me clicking around there, that's what I was doing. Um, yeah, I, I really like the way. Um, uh, so I've seen you speak a few times, Diane, and I just th there's a plain English that you use just things like. Uh, the unsustainable can't be sustained. And it, it made me think of the session we did, Claire, with uh, Professor Sadita Helm, talking really you know, frankly about sustainable economics and, and the kind of tipping points that, that Diane's mentioning there that are coming fast down the track. 
and you do hear more economists talking about them now but in particularly mainstream media it still feels like it's a choice we can do it in a few years time but those tipping points are getting closer and closer and it just that makes me worried um but there was another quote where i saw you speak diane and you and you said use the cogs and monsters and you said uh, i suppose i'm a monster <laughs> and I, <laughs> I just thought it was just the cheeky side of you coming out there and i was just like i just wondered if you'd say more about that today I can't remember why on earth I thought I was a monster. <laughs> I think you said, I am a monster. And I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, sorry. Too, too cheeky a question then. I think it was because you were talking then about monsters being the uncharted territory on a map. Um, and yeah, so, like, there's um, all maps where it would say, here be monsters, because they didn't know what was what was there. So that's the bit I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in the uncharted territory. Maybe that's what I meant. Uh -huh. So in terms of the, what economics should be then, do you think that's the uncharted territory now, that the, the economists really need to push the boundaries on what's coming rather than staying more in, in the comfort zone? Yeah, so this goes to the point about um, how you're introduced to economics and how simple it is. So people are taught um, a, a very simple approach. Everything's linear and straightforward. You could do the algebra or the charts really easily that way. and it then gets kind of socialized in. And so when you start thinking about an economic problem, you default to what did I learn in my first year at university as my way into thinking about this. But all of the assumptions that make that a good way of thinking about economic problems are probably never true, but are certainly not true in the economy now. Um, so the presence of tipping points, the fact that there are lots of information asymmetries, so we don't know everything that we ought to know to make good decisions, um, the externalities in something like climate, all of those mean that that approach is not a good starting point. So I'm arguing for um, just kind of tearing that up and starting from reality and then figuring out where are the gaps in terms of what tools we need to use to teach people how to, how to address this and doing it that way around. So I was very involved in um, setting up core, core economy, the textbook, and um, I think that's been fantastic for bringing into teaching economics, um, you know, evidence about what's going on, uh, power relations in the labour market, innovations, global warming, um, the fact that people have thought differently about economics at different points in time, so it's changed, there's, the, there's history of thought there as well. So that's all, all terrific, but I still hunger for something a bit more radical that would say we are in a global, dynamic, connected, unpredictable economy Let's start with that and see where we get to. I'm going to put my stupid hand up here and say, when you say externalities, what exactly do you mean? Just in case people are thinking, I'm certainly thinking, I think I know what you mean, but I want you to tell me. So it's um, a, a choice that an individual or a firm will make that it has consequences for other people. And they could be positive or negative. Um, but in the context of the environment, they're usually the negative ones that you are running your factory and you're emitting CO2 or pollutants. And um, it's an externality because you yourself don't have to bear the consequences. You don't have to pay for it. So a lot of policies then say, oh, there's that externality. Let's put a tax on the factory and that will, that will fix the problem, which is the simple textbook way of thinking about it. You were also talking about the sort of history of economic thought and models and how we're in a different era now. So I think you've said it somewhere that maybe we could be using stuff from the past and applying it to now as well. Is that fair enough that we shouldn't think everything that was old theory no longer applies? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I'm quite interested in now is the phenomenon of increasing returns to scale, which means that the bigger you are in a market like digital, like tech, um, the lower your costs are and the easier it is for you to dominate more and more of the market. So you've got the big, you know, big, big is, big is good in this kind of world. Always true to some extent, you know, aeroplanes have got uh, increasing returns to scale, shipbuilding, big heavy industries, but it's true of more and more of the economy um, in, in, in this digital era. It turns out that there's a lot of work done on this in the 1920s and some terrific papers but they were not, they didn't have algebra, they didn't have data. So they didn't bring the tools that we like to use as economists to the question of increasing returns. And what does that mean for market structure and policy? 
Um, but I think, you know, going back to those offers a lot of insight into how to think about, um, you know, tackling the problems that we've got now. Are you a lone voice kind of calling for this? You know, let's almost retrofit some stuff from the past on now and look at how we can apply it. Or are there lots of people that are working as economists that are thinking, do you know what, perhaps we, we revisit some of this stuff? It's an interesting question. Um, it, it feels like being a bit of a lone voice. Mm. Having said that, there's huge interest among professional economists um, in the book and in, in my talks when I talk about this. So I think... Many people are very interested and see the point, but it's quite hard to, um, you know, shift away from what's going to reward them in their career so they'll carry on doing what they were doing before. Mm. Susan, do you want to jump in? Yeah, and um, one of the things you've mentioned before is the, um, the 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 key journals that you have to get in if there's a certain academic career path you and how that limits thought. And we spoke to... Um, uh, Dr. Anna Advani, who's done the, the work on diversity in the economics um, profession, and I just wondered if, like, do you see that changing now? The 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 top five journals still limiting who becomes economics professors, or or is it still those journals that are the ones that are kind of the gold star to get to getting on in economics? Yeah, it's still those five, and uh, a whole bunch of Nobel laureates got together to write saying, "This is madness. Why are we doing this?" Um, but it's very hard to get out of that trap. So I think what's going to happen is that for economics departments, they're going to want people to publish in the top journals, but a lot of interesting economics will then go outside economics departments. This sounds very much like medicine as well. Unless you are aiming for those top publications and you get that peer review and all the kudos that comes with that and you've got published papers, you're not really considered to be serious. I mean, maybe I'm being horrible here, but I'm just wondering, you know, at what point do people think that's outmoded thinking? You know, that's completely bananas. You're, you're missing out. And, and also women don't necessarily get the same opportunities to publish, do they? Um, no, I mean, economics has a, has a problem with women um, and people from ethnic minorities and people from lower socioeconomic groups, just in general. So it's quite a homogeneous profession and is very similar to computer science and physics. And I think philosophy is similar as well. So a few subjects that are like that. Um, it's also, though, people who have been to certain universities for their PhDs who get to publish more in the top journals. So it's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And um, there's, there's just no sign of it changing. I mean, there are, lot, there are lots of other good journals, lots of other recognized journals. But when, when it comes to the crunch, if you've got the top five, you're going to be at an advantage compared to everybody else. Blimey, have a guess then. How long is it going to take to change that? Because that's quite, you know, that's that's aiming high to get into one of five journals that are taken seriously. And you're just thinking, what message does that send for diversity? Uh, I, th I think it will. I think people will work around it. A lot of people working on digital economics, for example, are starting to publish in general science journals or the computer science websites. So people will go for that instead. So it, it will crumble over time. Mm. But Susan, we've got some insights here, haven't we, from David Go? Oh, sorry, before I forget, we've got a comment to pick up on. Yeah, we... um, David, I'll just put, I can pin these to the bottom of the screen because the wonderful technology. Uh, Diane's refreshing goals issues for economists are medium to long term, but politicos are more short um, termist, electorally driven. And Claire, I we we often speak about the role of the media in this. Do you think? somehow we need to get the media thinking more long term or is that possible or are they just driven driven on the daily news cycle i think it's very hard to get away from that because news is news because it's just in and it gets replaced very quickly as we can see so i think it's quite a hard sell but i think it's if we start hearing more interesting arguments and and different perspectives and i must say diana you've given me a lot to think about with this i think we should all be made <laughs> to read different books and, uh, and and get away from the orthodoxies of what we think economy is all about so sorry i think we might have been having a glitch where there was a sound but we're not incredibly curious about the economy because i think we're quite scared of it unless we're specialists um journalists but you know, what I've just read there and what I've I've spoken to other people in this series, it's absolutely fascinating, but it's whether or not journalists will go the extra mile to go and do the research and put in the legwork to find out a bit more about what the economy could and should be like. Um, so, yeah, I think the news agenda doesn't help because it is short term. 
But I, I don't know what you think about that, Dan, because it does seem that the politicals are much more short term and you guys are forecasting further forward. It, it's um, a difficult problem. And part of it is that the business model of newspapers has been undermined by digital. So they don't have the money to pay the specialists that they used to. So I think there used to be a lot more specialist reporting, not not just about economics itself, but about areas like industrial policy and, and, and so on. So that's one thing. Um, but anybody who's trying to give policy advice about anything, economics, health, you know, science policy, um, it struggles with this problem that the political attention span is um, really short and um, nobody's got a solution to that. And it seems to me it's much worse in the UK even than some other countries because um, there's all the business about uh, U-turns. We've, we've got a uh, first-past-the-post system, so that encourages opposition between the parties. Uh, we've got all the, these um, taboos like not doing U-turns, not having postcode lotteries and so on. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying I don't have the answer to the challenge. I'm just wondering, if we're in an election year. <laughs> Whoever ends up being in government by the end of the year, boy, they've got a task, haven't they? I mean, huge challenges. So to me, they're probably going to be you know, thinking about the immediate horror, not thinking as broadly and as long term as you. That is a problem. You've worked at the Treasury. You know how this rolls. What do you do to change that thinking, short of changing the electoral system? Well, I guess um, we'll see what the size of the government majority is after the election. That will make a big difference to how bold they feel they can be. Um, I don't envy um, a new chancellor post-election because um, we are poorer than we think we are. You know, we've let our infrastructure crumble. We had our annual conference here at the Bennett Institute on Friday. And the figure that stood out for me was um, a colleague who's an engineer. She said, we've got 28,000 railway bridges in the UK. 14,000 of them were built before 1914, and we're not spending maintenance money on them. So paying attention to um, the way that a lot of our infrastructure needs uh, investing. So we had this idea of um, calling for universal basic infrastructure. So everybody in the country, as a matter of right as a resident, has a certain number of um, assets that they can use to get on with their life and, and, and better themselves. And that covers transport, broadband, schools and hospitals, um, GP surgeries, you know, the whole array of things that, without which you cannot lead a good life as a, an economically active citizen. Um, and it's a, it's a big challenge. A lot of places are way, way below where they ought to be. Is there anyone getting it right amongst our uh, European neighbours? I, I know it's it's not horses for courses. It's, well, it is horses for courses. Everybody's different. They come from a different economic background, but we seem to be I don't know, abnormally bizarre and out of, out of kilter with an awful lot of the other European economies at the moment. Not just the European, it's also the Asian and now even the US economy in terms of thinking strategically about economic policy. So the idea of industrial policy has, has definitely come back. Uh, we're in the middle of two big technological revolutions, one in digital and AI and one in energy transition. And in that context, if you don't have a strategic view of where you want your economy to go, and some consistency in policy, you're going to be stuffed. So um, we need to do that, and we seem to be out on a limb in that regard. We are the most, pretty much the most centralized economy in the OECD, um, so we're out on a limb in that way as well. And um, it, this might be related, we've got the worst productivity performance among our peers. So we've got a, a, a really long haul to become again the kind of country that many people think we are at the moment. But we're, we're much poorer and we've not been growing for a decade and a half. You're scaring me now, Diane, because I'm thinking it is much worse yeah. than I thought it was, and it wasn't good to begin with. Susan, are you um, wanting to read out? Yeah. One of the things I've heard you say before on that is um, that the economists have been slow to recognise the importance of health. And you've got a, the UDEC gave the Health Foundation lecture at the end of last year, and you've got a podcast out today with them talking to Torsten Bell for anyone that's interested in that. Do you want to just say something on that to give people a taster of, of what you um, mentioned in those two things? And we'll post them in the event follow up from this. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, so we've got this concept of human capital in economics, not a very poetic phrase, but it means um, what are people's skills and abilities? And that's always been measured by what, what's their educational attainment formally, which is a bit inadequate anyway, 
but that left out health. And if you have um, a chronically bad back or um, you're, uh, you've got diabetes, you're not going to be a healthy, productive individual. Your human capital is going to be diminished compared to what it might be. So there is now starting to be work to put measures of health into these human capital measures. Um, but, you know, in terms of spending per capita on health and education in this country, that's been going down. So if you're, you're kind of um, reducing the amount that you invest in that, and those are investments that need to be continually maintained because you've always got new people coming along. Um, uh, we, we, you know, that's, that's not investing for the future. So my bottom line really is thinking about all the things that show that we've got confidence in our future and how do we um, make sure that it's a good one. And that's all about the investment that we've not been doing. Mm-hmm. We've got some comments here. Um, I don't know, Susan, you want to read one? I'll do one. Um, so I think that brings us on nicely to the question about um, surely waiting to invest in the uh, until the economy is growing, growing again is a recipe for disaster. Um, is there not a need to spend on infrastructure now? Um, yeah. It's the question. Yeah. I completely agree with that. And all the conversation that we've had recently is, um, we can't afford the investment because we've not got any growth. If we don't do the investment, we won't have any growth. And in fact, we'll get into a doom loop where it shrinks over time. The capacity to invest shrinks over time. Because what matters isn't the level of the deficit in pounds or debt in pounds. It's how does that um, relate to the growth of the economy such, such that you can afford to pay back what the interest is. So it's a, you know, it's not just oh, we've only got 10 billion pounds this year. It's a much more complicated calculus. But unless you change the denominator of that and get some growth, you're never going to afford to invest. Gosh, there's so so much to consider, but we're getting into the sort of final minutes of this. And I'm just wondering if you've got a big sort of takeaway, a few facts that you want people to hang on to and remember. And maybe if there's somebody political watching this as well, you know, maybe it's somebody that might be in a position to do something about it one day, who knows? But what are your big takeaways that you want us to remember from what you've said in the book and what you've said today, Diane? Oh, a big takeaway. Um, So... I do think a lot about what do we mean by things getting better? You know, what does that mean? How do you measure it? Who is it getting better for? And I think keeping that as your kind of guide to what you decide to do, either as a business or or in government. Um, And that takes you to all the issues about not just relying on GDP. You think about, in effect, what's the economy's balance sheet? What infrastructure do we have? What kind of environment do we have? Um, But also broader questions about well-being, which speak to people's mental health. You know, we're a knowledge economy. What goes on in people's minds really matters for their productivity as well as in, you know, for their for their own well-being. So let's think about it in that holistic way and um, recognizing that we're in the middle of these huge structural changes, the energy and the digital changes. They're general purpose technologies, to use a bit of jargon, if you'll forgive me, they're going to affect everything in the economy. And it means that we're in the middle of this period of, of great upheaval. We've had a bad run, to be fair, haven't we? We've had the pandemic. We've had Brexit. We're now in a cost of living thing. We've got a war on Europe's doorstep. I mean, you could get very down about this, but actually I'm guessing, that, I think you say it as well, the, the pandemic proved to us we can be quite innovative when we have to be. So maybe it takes something brutal to shake us out of our torpor and think differently and act differently. It would be nice not to need the crisis, but um, yes. I think you're right, it did, it did trigger some um, changes in the way people thought about what to do. I mean, take the example of the vaccine task force and the, the kind of policy intervention that demonstrated that um, we can we can do things like that when we need to. So Susan, do you think we've answered the question, um, what should the economy be like? Or do we still need I, to nail that? I think we've opened a discussion that is just so much bigger than we can scratch the surface with in 30 minutes but hopefully given a taste to people to an encouragement to read Diane's book we will fo- post longer um, slightly more technical um, webinars that, that Diane's done before and just encourage people to to listen and, and learn more. Um, I do think the Understanding Scotland Economy Tracker for me and um, that we do every quarter links to so much of what you're saying because there's one number in that that I look at first every single time 
and it's the number of people losing sleep over their finances and it just shows how fragile things have got so you know in some ways Claire I challenge you to say actually we are in a bit of a crisis now because we've got um, 43 percent of people in the last quarter in Scotland that are in the 35 to 44 age group that are losing sleep over their finances that's massive how are you going to improve productivity or get anywhere near growth if if that bit of your workforce is is you know on a course to high cortisol levels and more illness and all the things Diane touched on there when when she you know just mentioned health so yeah there's there's so much more to do but anyway we're over time so and we always like to to bring it in as close in on time as possible so I just have to wrap up and say thank you thank you for joining us today Diane and and thank giving you. us your time when we know you're so busy. Claire, wonderful to work with you as always. And um, we'll be back after Easter with another Economy in Plain English conversation. But in the meantime, anyone that's joining us for the first time today, you can catch up on our past conversations and share with your friends. They're all available on YouTube and LinkedIn. And um, tomorrow, those of you that are around in Edinburgh, we have Baroness uh, Catherine Ashton joining us for a discussion um, about modern diplomacy. And some of the things here, I think, you know, there's a there's a lot of diplomacy involved in what economics is for some people because some people really have strong opinions and actually opening up minds to it might be something different is a, is a challenge. So um, really interesting conversation coming tomorrow. Please do remember the David Hume Institute is a charity and we can only continue to bring a few new research and thought provoking events due to the generous durations of our supporters and donation uh, details of how to donate are on our website. So just finally, thank you very much everyone for another brilliant discussion today. And until next time, cheerio. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Diane.